Geniu, jak się ustawiamy? When I first started to play the music of Groutman, I don't think I realised how big and important this composer was going to become to me. Of course, I found out that there are 48 works by him which feature this instrument, so that's one of the reasons I'm pursuing this, this music. But probably more importantly, when I play this music on the instrument, I feel like this man really understood idiomatic kind of features of this instrument, how to get the best out of it in a way that no other composer I've found so far could do. You just know when you're playing it that this is natural on the instrument and he absolutely knew what he was doing. Thank you. 
How was your trip to Germany? I can't wait to have any details. You know, Graupner story, Graupner project, the birthplace of Graupner. Mm -hmm. how, how was it? Well, it was very important for me to experience where he'd lived and where he grew up and to feel the places personally. So mm -hmm. I went to his birth town, Kirschberg. Do you have any pictures of Yes, yes. Young... I actually took some pictures here. You'll see the plaque which shows this is the house he lived in in Kirschberg. So that's the actual evidence that he did live there. And I've got many pictures of the town. Here's the, the church, the local church. Uh -huh. And it's from there that I got this opinion that actually he was born in Barenwald. So okay. that's the local knowledge is what tells me. So we have to rely on it. We, Any interesting uh, meetings you have, perhaps? Uh, with someone not, not so much there. I mean, in the church office, of course, I talked to the people there about yeah. this. But um, no, so we, I was only there for a brief time. I mm -hmm. wanted to visit all three of these places so mm -hmm. I could experience them firsthand. And then, of course, I had to go to Darmstadt. Start, which is where the Christoph Grautner Gesellschaft is, is housed. And this is an extraordinary collection because unlike many composers, all of Grautner's music is there, every single piece, because after, after a legal dispute, it was not available. So it stayed together for 250 years, almost 300 years now for some of those old manuscripts. It's a long time indeed, yeah. And so the, the exciting thing there was to actually hold in my hand these manuscripts were 300 years old. Some of the music we're playing here, here was the manuscript. And so, of course, in being in Darmstadt, I could walk the streets where he walked. Also found another plaque here. This is the house he lived in, in Darmstadt. Oh, really? Luisenstrasse. So, yeah, and then I could go also, this is the gravestone here in the cemetery where he's buried. They don't know exactly where he's buried. In Darmstadt. In Darmstadt. Oh, yes. And so there are, I think, six or seven names on this gravestone, uh -huh. all very prominent artists, musicians, and so on. Any interesting uh, people you have the chance to talk about, about yes, his well, legacy? Yes, the, 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 the director of the, of the Gesellschaft is um, Professor Ursula Kramer. So I spent quite some time with her. We had an interview with her. She Do took you me, have it? Yes, yes, I can show you. Here's a picture of her. And we're in the, in the library here looking at manuscripts. And one of the most exciting things she did was take me to visit one of the hunting castles, which the Landgrave built scattered around Darmstadt when he wanted to have a week or a couple of weeks away hunting. He would go here and he would take Grautner with him and the musicians. So I got to experience being in these buildings, in these rooms, and that was just magic. For me, essential to, to play this music is to, to feel the streets they walked on. So speaking about the feelings, how you feel about interpreting the music of Graupner nowadays with a modern tune on modern instruments? <laughs> That's It's a good question, because um, most people who know about Graupner in the music world are early music specialists, because they have really brought it into their repertoire. But I find with musicians playing modern instruments, most of them haven't even heard of Graupner. Mm -hmm. So one of the missions of this film was to try and promote this music to a complete wide circle of musicians. And I think there is a place for performing this music on modern instruments. Of course, we observe what Baroque practice we know about and we can absorb. But I think, as I say, this music should be played by all musicians. So, this is the place, this is the venue. How do you feel about the acoustic? Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, this is the kind of venue this music was written for. Very, very high dome ceiling up here, many cavities, so one doesn't know the acoustic until you come inside, but it feels very, very promising. Yes, indeed.
Owińska, malownicza miejscowość na północ od Poznania, w niej perła baroku. Historia sięga XIII wieku. Na pomysł padli książę, książę Przemysł I i jego brat Bolesław Pobożny. Wybudowali tu kościół wraz z klasztorem. Pierwotnie był w stylu gotyckim i zostały sprowadzone strzebnice tu siostry Cysterki. 1249 rok, 21 października. W 1720 roku był pożar. Duże były straty i potem ówczesna Kseni zleciła Janowi Kateneciemu i Pompeo Ferrariemu przebudowę kościoła wraz z klasztorem już w stylu barokowym. Co jest ciekawe, że freski w tym kościele malował brat Adam Szwach. Do roku 1835 były tutaj siostry cysterki. Od 1838 budynka klasztoru był zakład dla umysłowo chorych. W 1939 roku przebywało 1100 chorych. Część została wywieziona do lasów obornickich, a część do Fortu Siódmego w Poznaniu i tam została zagazowana. W obecnym czasie mieści się tutaj szkoła dla osób niewidomych i niedowidzących.
So, the Polish piece, um, I love the way you play it. How you feel it about? Is it original? Is it uh, in the style of Baroque music? First thing to say is I think this is a really well-crafted piece and I really like playing it. I think it's strong, convincing. Whether it's in Baroque, written in the Baroque era is another matter. I suspect getting to know the piece that it's more likely 20th century Polish composer writing in the style of the Baroque, which is a quite common practice where you have Henri Casadesu, who wrote what we used to know as the J.C. Bach concerto for the viola and the Handel concerto for the viola. But now we just say it is by him in the style of those composers. We also have Fritz Kreisler who did very similar things and actually later confessed himself that they were actually by him. What we know, uh, it was prepared or written or arranged by Jerzy Dobrzański, a composer, a conductor, and he did it in late 70s. It's a lovely one. I yeah. love the way you play it. It's, uh, it's a nice piece with Polish flavor, Polish mm -hmm. dances inside. So we have to make the decision. Do we call this created by, mm -hmm. prepared by, based on manuscript sketches? The problem at the moment is we have no manuscript sketches, so we can't really say prepared by as much as we would like to. It's probably safest to say created by, in the style of. And it has some nice Polish elements in it as well. So, in other words, it's not an anonymous piece, uh, not an anonymous piece from 1750. It's like created in the 20th century with so many question marks, but uh, I would bet on created more than prepared or written. I would agree. In the style of. In the style of.
Viola d'amore. Viola of love. Altówka miłosna in Polish. Uh, your story about this instrument? When did it happen that you switched from <laughs> viola to viola d'amore? Well, the story actually began quite a long time ago, about 35 years, I think, when a, a man who was quite a famous potter knocked on my door and he said, I've made an instrument and I want you to teach me how to play it. And I said, well, show me this instrument. So he opened this case and here's this instrument with seven strings and seven strings underneath. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, it's a viola d'amore. I've copied an existing one, but I want to learn now how to play it. So I gave him some lessons. I said, I don't know how to play it, but we'll learn together. So I transferred what technique I had from viola to this instrument. Now that was the beginning of the story. Some years later, I was asked to play a viola d'amore piece with guitar, the double concerto of Vivaldi. So I called him and I said, please, may I borrow that instrument? So he said, sure. He sent it to me. So that was my first experience to really play it in concert. And that was probably about 30 years ago. And then, then he said to me, look, I want you to keep this instrument because I'm not ever going to play it seriously, so you can have it. So I thought, right, I want to really pursue this, but I'm too busy now with my career as a viola player. So I put it under the bed for the next 25 years. And I said to myself, when I reach that big age that has a six in it, <laughs> I'm going to come back to this instrument and I'm going to teach myself to play it. And that's exactly what I did. And I really fell in love with it, this incredible sound. So within a short time, I said, okay, I'm going to really make a transfer to make this my primary instrument from now on. So that's kind of how the story happened.